Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Ooh. That sounded good. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. An honor. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you for always thinking about me and inviting me over to talk to your congregation. This is the third time that he's invited me to his congregation. I've, I've really, every time he calls me up, he says, hey, you got a, a such and such date free? I'm like, for you, any day's free. Because I know that, and, and, and I travel a lot. I travel all over the world now doing these motivational seminars and conferences. And a lot of times, you know, I'm on the road on Sundays but I know that I can always tune in on the internet to watch pastor because I say that that's my pastor there. When he first invited me, oh, by the way, you didn't tell him that the ending of the story about the car wash, did you? You didn't tell him the ending. Do you ever know how the story ended, really? He asked me, he said, by the way, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going that way. He said, good, in that case, I'm going that way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, when, when we first met and he first invited me to, to his uh, church, he asked me, he said, uh, do you mind coming over and talking to my congregation and sharing your story? And I'd never, I'd never spoken in public before that. I mean, never. And y'all know what the number one fear is of speaking, is speaking in public, right? The number one fear of people is to stand up on a stage and talk to a bunch of people. That's the number one fear. The number two fear is death. So I figured, well, I got this one conquered. The second one should be pretty easy, huh? <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> first time they invited me, he said, well, just come up there and you, you can just stand by me uh, on the altar. He said, and I'll, I'll just ask you a bunch of questions and you just answer the questions that I ask you. I said, like, okay, sure, it sounds pretty simple. And he said, oh, by the way, I got three services. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do the three services, no problem, we can do that. And so I, when, I, when I was thinking about what to talk about that first service, I was like, well, what, what, what have I got to talk about? I mean, I've never done that before. And I thought, well, I'll just start from the beginning, you know, from day one. And that's how I built all my conferences, it's just based on my life because my life has been what God has wanted for me to do. That's what he created my purpose in life, was to share all of my life that I've lived. I was born on January 13, 1966. That's 55 years for the ones doing the math in their head. <laughs> and it was 55 years ago that I started on this journey of life, of being able to collect stories, experiences, to be able to now share with people, but it's a testimony of what God can really do through someone like me. And not only what he can do through me, but if he's done what he's done with me, just think what he could do through you. You've got your whole body. You've got your arms, your legs, your head. Well, a couple of them have a head. So what else could he do through you if you just allowed it? When I was born, I was coming out my mother's womb when all of a sudden the doctors, they noticed that, you know, I didn't come with all, <coughs> with all the, you know, package included. So they took one look at me and they thought that I was dead. They realized I wasn't dead, of course, when they, I turned around and looked at them and said, no, 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 wait a minute, I'm not dead, I'm here, <laughs> hang on. Uh, and then they kind of, you know, the, uh, uh, he's not dead. And so they took me and they placed me in my mom's arms. And they told my mom, said, oh, we're sorry, ma'am. We, we made a mistake. He's not dead. Uh, they said, but, you know, he doesn't have any arms and his legs didn't really completely, you know, develop. And, and there's, who knows what else is missing, you know, in his body. So we don't know how long he's going to live. And so they gave my mom the advice to enjoy every second of life that they could spend with me because they didn't know for how long I was going to be here. As a matter of fact, they didn't give my mom a lot of hope. They said, he probably won't be here, but maybe just a couple of hours or a couple of days, but don't expect a lot. My mom didn't know what to think at the time. She just kind of 
you know, she took me to her arms. She hugged me real tight. And she just hugged me. And then she looked at me and she said, let it be God's will. That's all she said. Let it be God's will. I don't know if she realized at the moment just exactly how powerful, how powerful those words were. If she really realized what it was that she was saying at that moment of placing my life in God's hands and saying, God, do your thing. And so as life went on, they realized that I was going to be around for more than just a couple hours. And uh, by the time I got to be around the age of five, I have two brothers. I have an older brother. He's a year older than me. And I have a younger brother. He's four years younger. I'm the sandwich, you know, the one in the middle. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and my parents, you know, they, they raised me just like my brothers. You know, no, no different. You know, I had the same the same responsibilities and the same duties and, and got to do the same things that they did because they, my parents never believed that uh, there was any reason to hide me, which was a common thing to do back in those days. I was born in Mexico City. I don't know if I, I didn't mention that at the beginning. But I was originally you know, from Mexico City. And back in those days in the 60s in Mexico, like in many third world countries, you know, people with handicaps, kids with handicaps just didn't really exist, okay? I mean, yeah, they were born, but most people would hide them. You know, they would take the kids and, you know, shove them in a closet and lock the door and come back 20 years later and check and see if they're still there. You know, or they would send them off, you know, to go live on a farm somewhere, you know, at the aunt's or uncle's or grandparents' house on the farm somewhere and go back and check on them, you know, 20 years later and see if they got cured because that's the way they treated a handicap was like if it was some kind of disease that needed to be cured, you know, which is not. I mean, you know, so far I haven't walked up to anybody and hugged them and their arms fell off, you know. <laughs> uh, have, having a handicap is, is just a different lifestyle. That's all it is. It's just living differently. In my case, well, you know, this world wasn't made for people without arms. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way. This world was made for people with arms, and everything that needs to be done was you know, made to be able to do with arms. So I've had to adapt myself, adapt my life, adapt my way of thinking of how I'm going to be able to do what I need to do. In which case, my feet became my hands. Everything that you do with your hands, I can do it too, but I do it with my feet. Okay, you can look me up on YouTube and you can see a whole bunch of videos up there of how I do everything in the world with my feet, just like you do. Everything from cooking to washing dishes, washing clothes, sweeping, driving, building computers, you know, everything. Everything that you do with your hands, I do it but with my feet. And so as I got older, I started reaching the, the age where, you know, I started asking questions. You know, I would pick up a book and say, you know, uh, what does this say, you know, and, and what are they doing there, and, and how come they're, you know, and, and questions that most kids always start asking. So then my parents started noticing that I did have something between my ears, except besides the wax that was in there. And so they realized that it was time for me to start learning something. So they started looking for an opportunity to put me into the educational system, you know, put me in school so that I could learn just like my brothers and any other kid. Unfortunately, again, the mentality back in those days was that no school would take me. You know, the schools would take one look at me and they're like, uh, 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 you, you know, we're full right now. Come back next year. Maybe next year we'll have a space for him, you know. Or literally one time one of the teachers asked my mom, said, excuse me, ma'am, but how do you really think that he's going to be able to learn if he doesn't have any hands? And my mom just looked at her and said, what, is your brain on your hands or what? <laughs> because that's what that question sounded like. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was a different mentality. Not like nowadays, you know, things have changed a lot and, you know, they've learned a lot of things. But uh, I didn't get an opportunity to actually go to school, at least not in Mexico. 
But if God does everything his way, and if everything that God does is perfect, and we live under this perfect plan that God creates, you know, it was that uh, as my parents were looking for a school, they ran into this, uh, this man that was traveling, he was visiting Mexico, he was from Houston, and he happened to be the head guy, the director of the Shriners Hospital in Houston. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Shriners Hospital, but they're a good little hospital for orthopedic kids where they help them, uh, you know, with any kind of handicap that they have. And so this doctor took an interest in me and he brought me to Houston from Mexico. And that was why I orig originally I came to the U.S. was to the Shriners Hospital where they originally fitted me with artificial arms and artificial legs. I used to have those artificial arms, you know, that the you have two hooks for hands and you grab everything with the hooks. There's a picture up there on the screen. As you can see, I had all these wires running all over, you know, my body, my chest, my back, to be able, just to be able to open the hooks or bend the elbows. And then the artificial legs were like walking on stilts. And I had to put my feet inside of these tubes. And, you know, as I got, out, I got older, they would increase the height. Well, I had the, the artificial arms and legs from the time I was six until I was 16. And at the age of 16, I said, I said, no more, I've had enough, I don't need them. Especially because by the time I got 16 and they kept raising the height on those stilts, you know, I'd look down and I was like, uh, that's a long way down there. <laughs> and especially the problem was that if I, if I was to fall down, I couldn't get back up. You know, there was no way that I could even get up. I had to get somebody to help me stand up. You know, most people when they stand up, as most of you probably, you know, you reach down with your hand and you push up, you know, or you grab onto something to pull up. Well, you know, I didn't have that to, to do. And then on top of that, the stilts didn't bend very well. So when I was 16, I said, nah, that's it, no more. And so I did away with them and I was like, you know, hey, this is the way God made me, okay? This is the way, I, you know, he intended for me to be. So I just use what I got. And my, my feet have always been my hands to do everything. I'm totally independent. I don't depend on anybody for nothing at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I live by myself. Um, you know, I do everything in my house, you know, cook, wash, like I said. Um, and then as I got older, well, uh, my parents kept looking for a school in the Shriners Hospital, then recommended a school to my parents that they had, you know, referred other kids to, which is a school for handicapped kids. There's a little town outside of Houston called Port Arthur. Port Arthur, Texas. I don't know how many of you may be familiar with Port Arthur, but that's where I grew up. The school was like a boarding school. I lived there by myself, not with my family. My parents uh, stayed in Mexico. My whole family, as a matter of fact, they all still live in Mexico. I'm the only one that's here. Um, and I grew up at that school with 100 kids. It was 50 boys and 50 girls. We all had some kind of different you know, disability, whether it be cerebral palsy or blind, deaf, uh, polio, spina bifida, you name it. I mean, we had all the flavors there. <laughs> and so I, that's where I grew up. And I would go back to visit my parents and my family for the summer vacation for three months and uh, two weeks for Christmas. So I was flying back and forth to, uh, to visit my parents and stuff. And, uh, and I grew up there from the time I was six until I was 16. Again, at the age of 16 was when I graduated from high school. I graduated at 16 because my birthday falls in the summertime, so I graduated in May. And I started college right there and then immediately at the uh, college next door, which is uh, in Beaumont, uh, Lamar University. And, uh, and that's where I studied computer science engineering. That was exactly what, uh, what I had always want, liked doing was working with computers. So that's the career that I chose was computers. I saw a future in computers back when people didn't think there was a much future with the box and the keyboard. But I did. I saw that there was something in it for me because it was all mental work. It wasn't physical, it was mental. You know, the challenge of writing programs and getting the computer to do what I wanted to do. And that's exactly what I studied. Well, after college, then my parents said, okay, that's it. Okay, we paid for your college, we paid for everything, now it's time for you to pay for your own ticket. So I had to go look for work. Anybody here ever looked for work before? You know what that's like, right? 
at this full-time job with no pay. <laughs> well, that's what I did. I went, and went out and looked for work. But again, I ran into the same story like when my parents were trying to put me in school. You know, I would go knock, go knock on the doors at the companies and ask them, you know, hey, look, you know, I got my paper here. It says, you know, that I learned something in school. You know, will you give me a job? But they would, of course, look at me and they, you know, they immediately, they, they couldn't tell me, now we can't hire you because you're handicapped. And, you know, that's discrimination, of course. But they could say, oh, we're sorry, but we've already filled the position. Come back next week or come back next month or come back in a couple of years. I was like, okay, I've heard this song before. And so one day I was, I was with a friend of mine, and he told me, he said, Gabriel, you're never going to get a job. I was like, gee, thanks. I thought you were my friend. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the encouragement. And he's like, no, 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 seriously. He said, you're never, you're never going to get a job, he said, if you keep doing the same thing that you're doing. And I said, like, well, what's wrong with what I'm doing? I mean, I'm looking for a job just like everybody else. You know, I look in the paper, send him a copy of my resume, call for an interview, go to the interview. He said, yeah, and then what? Well, then they tell me, I'm uh, yeah, sorry, but the position's already been filled. <laughs> Don't call me, I'll, you know, we'll call you. <laughs> he said, exactly, that's, that's why you're never going to get a job. Because you keep doing the same thing over and over and over that keeps getting you rejected. If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same results. He said, you've got to learn how to think outside the box. I was like, the box? Uh, what box? I don't see no box right here. He said, yeah, you've got to think outside the box. He said, have you ever watched a mouse inside of a box? I was like, no, I don't play with mice. And he's like, well, a, a mouse in a box, all he knows how to do is go around and 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 around, and around until he dies. That's all a mouse knows how to do. He doesn't know how to get out. He said, that's how most people live their life. They live their life going around and around and around and expect to have something better and get a better life and get you know, forward when they're not looking outside the box. All they're doing is going around and around and around until they die. He said, you want something different? Do something different. Well, I didn't understand what my friend was telling me at that time with that story. So I said, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, sure. See you later, take your box with you. And so then later, I, you know, one night uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this great idea. You want to know what my idea was? No, you don't want to know? Yeah. Well, tell me, yeah. yeah. There you go. My great idea was if nobody was going to hire me, then I'd just start my own business. <laughs> <laughs> what a great idea. Yeah. I'll be my own boss. Yeah. I don't have to, I'm not going to tell myself no, right? <laughs> don't have to send a copy of the resume. I already know the story. <laughs> don't have to negotiate a salary. Don't have to call in sick to work if I don't feel like working. <laughs> yeah, I'll be my own boss. So I went to the courthouse, registered my business name, came back home, stuck up a piece of paper up there next to the one saying that my college was paid for. And then I sat at my desk and I was like, oh man, now what? A business is not a business if you don't have customers. <laughs> Where do you get those at? <laughs> My mom didn't teach me that. College didn't teach me that. So where do you, where do you get customers? I was like, think, think, think. Okay, let's think outside the box here. Where's the box? Let's go get a box. So then I thought about it and I was like, ah, oh, I know what I'll do. So I picked up this tablet where I was keeping track of all the companies that I had previously called them for an interview and went to the interview and knew exactly what they wanted, but they rejected me as an employee. So what I did was I was calling them back. But this time, as I was calling them back, I wasn't calling them to ask for work, not as an employee. I was calling them as a business, as a company. And I would say, hey, we know you need this program. We'd like to offer you our services as a company to let us write this program for you. I would offer them to do it for half the cost of what they were going to pay a full-time employee, and also I offered to do it in half the time that they had allotted for the program to be developed. Not a bad deal, huh? Did everybody take it? No, not everybody. As a matter of fact, only one company took, took me up on the offer. Only one. But that's all I needed. That's all I needed was one opportunity. That's all life 
has to give us. That's all we really as human beings, I think that's all we ask for is to give us one opportunity. Give me a chance to show you who I am. Give me a chance to show you what I'm made of. Give me one chance to show you what I'm capable of doing. If I fail you, then it's on me. But if I'm successful, then you're the one that's going to be. And that's all I asked for was one opportunity. And thanks to that one company that gave me that one chance, I was able to grow the company because they referred me, they liked the work that I did for them, or rather that my company did for them, even though they didn't know it was me. Okay. <laughs> Until I went to go pick up the check. <laughs> I went to go pick up the check and the owner looked at me and said, uh, I remember you, I interviewed you about six months ago, right? Yeah. I don't, I, I don't recall, why do I owe you this check? I said, because we wrote, I wrote the program. And like, oh, it's your, your company? I said, yeah, it's my company. And like, wow, I didn't know that. And he's like, would you like to come work for us now? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but, he, but he, he referred me to some of his customers and some of his vendors. And within the first three years, I was already grossing two and a half million dollars a year. Not bad for a kid that wasn't supposed to be able to learn because he didn't have hands. Or a kid that was only supposed to live for a couple of hours. Or a couple of days. <clears throat> Thanks to that, uh, that business that I had, writing programs, we then started selling the programs to, uh, well, I was able to hire more people to work for me. Uh, and then we started writing programs for other companies, and these companies then started sending us to other countries, mostly Mexico and Latin America, uh, because I you know, speak Spanish. And so with that, uh, my business grew, and as I would travel to like Mexico and, and stuff, they would say, hey, you think you can get us these uh, computers and these programs and uh, these printers and all these things from the U.S. cheaper than we can buy them here in Mexico? I was like, yeah, yeah I can get it cheaper over there. Well, guess what? I started a second company that was an import-export company <laughs> where I was importing and exporting you know, stuff down, down south. So then as the uh, years went by, the, a couple of years later, the internet was born and uh, my customers started calling me and asking me, hey, hey, bro, you know anything about this thing they call the internet? Anything about it? Is that something about an email? You know what that is? I was like, yeah, I know a little bit about email, yeah. And they're like, yeah, well, we need to get an email set up because the government said they won't do business with us unless we have an email address. And they won't do business with us unless we have something called a website. Do you know anything about a website? I was like, yeah, yeah, we know. So I started a third company that ran nothing but internet business and teaching companies how to use the internet and all the stuff that goes along with it. And then later on, the company started saying, hey, Gabriel, we got these products and stuff. We, you know, we'd like to be able to sell on the internet. Do you know anything about how to sell on the internet, how to market, you know, and the search engines and all that good stuff? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I know a little bit about that too. Well, I started a fourth company that dedicated itself to nothing but the internet. And then it's if I didn't have enough to do, and I didn't tell this in the other two services, but if I didn't have anything else to do, then I, started, I also started a taqueria. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm still Mexican, okay? <laughs> I love tacos. But anyway, all those things have just been experiences that I, that I, that I went through, that I've learned, that you know, I, there was something that I had to learn in each one of those. But it wasn't until you know, one day that I was sitting back in my office thinking, you know, there's got to be more to life than just business. You know, life isn't just all about money. A lot of people think that it's a big deal to have money. And, you know, well, if I only had money, you know, I could have a better life. And I'm like, not really. You can have all the money in the world and still not have a good life. And I sat back in my chair one day thinking, what am I missing? What am I missing? There's something missing in my life. And I, th and, I, and I remember back to my days in college when I met my, my I, I lived in the dorms and my first roommate that I had, uh, he, he lived about an hour away from the dorms. I don't know why he lived in the dorms. Well, I, it was because God sent him there <laughs> to be my roommate. But uh, he, was a, he was a son of a preacher, a Baptist preacher. 
And every weekend he would go home to his dad's church because he was real participant with his dad in his church. He was a music minister and played the keyboards and stuff. And every weekend here would always invite me over to his dad's church. He'd say, hey, come on over with me. You'll have fun. You'll you really like you. You'll meet a lot of nice people. And after serving, you know, the little old ladies, they cooked this really cool meal, you know. <laughs> they were trying to entice me through the stomach, you know. And I, and I was like, no, that's okay. You know, I've got an exam I've got to study for, so that's okay. Just go on. But I remember one weekend that he left, and I was there in the dorms. And I, for some reason, I don't remember why now, but I was... I was feeling lonely and I was kind of depressed and I was like, you know, what, what, what is there in life, you know? And I, walked, I was walking around the room when I looked over at my roommate's desk and he had left his Bible, or one of the many Bibles, he always carried some kind of Bible with him. And so he left his Bible there and I walked over and I said, eh, I'm going to go see what the Bible is all about over there. And I walked over there and I, I noticed that he had left it open and I didn't want to turn the page because, you know, I thought it was important why he left it on a page there. But he left it exactly in the, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 was the one that he had highlighted. And I don't know if you know the story of, of 1 Samuel, but that's where, you know, they were looking for the new king to replace, you know, the one that was there. And God sent Samuel out to... Uh, Jesus' house out there to look, look for the next king, which we all know ended up being King David. Well, it was in the, in the verses there that Samuel is going through all of Jesse's kids, and the first one comes in, and uh, God had told him that, you know, one of those kids was going to be, and I'm saying kids, they're all grown men, that one of those was going to be the next, the next king. And the first one comes through, and God said, Nat, next Second one comes through, not next. Third one, not next. Until all seven, you know, that Jesse had presented went through. And then Sam was like, no, God said there's got to be, you know, is there another one around here? Because God said, you know, one of your kids is going to be the next king. And, and, and Jesse said, well, yeah, there's one more. He's out tending to the sheep out there. And Sam said, I don't care. Bring him in. You know, I got to see who he is. And so as soon as he walked in, God told him that's the one. And that was King David. Well, Anyway, throughout that whole story, the one verse that really hit me and the one that changed my whole life at that moment was the one verse 16, 7, that said, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward experience, but the Lord looks at the heart. When I read that verse... I broke down into tears because I knew right there and then that all this time I had thought that the outward uh, body that I had was what I had to live with and the rejections and the comments and the jokes and all the things that people had said to me at one time in my life, I thought that was going to be the rest of my life. But after reading this verse and seeing that God looks at my heart, I was like, wow. Totally changed my life. It was at that moment that then I called up my roommate. He had gone home to his parents' house. I called him up. It was at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, it's time. He came back to the dorm, picked me up, took me back to the church, to his dad's church. During that service, I accepted Christ in my life. And then after that, his father baptized me in that church, and life was never the same. And when I looked back at those, and when I had looked back at that memory and remembered that, you know, there was more, there was more to life than just business, is then that I realized that actually my calling was to be able to do something different, to do something for God. And so it was that one day I got in my car and I went to the car wash. <laughs> and you've heard the story where 
after meeting Pastor and doing the service at his church, I was invited to do to go to some of the kids' churches. I mean, church of schools from the kids. A couple of the kids that went to that church, their parents invited me to their kids' school. And then I started getting invitations to other churches and other schools and then businesses and then other cities, other states, other countries. And God made it clear exactly what my purpose in life was. That it was for me to take his word, to take his message, to take this body as the way he made it, to be an example of what an awesome God we have. Of what it is that he can do to somebody like me. And what he's been able to be a witness and a testimony to millions of people all over the world. I came up with this slogan, if I can, you can. And that's the, that's the name of my, my main uh, conference that I give all over the world, where I tell people, if I can do it, so can you. If I can do it, you can too. How many of you here have hands? How many of you have hands? Raise your hands. Let me see, let me see all your hands. Let me see. Raise them, raise, 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 raise them real high, real high. Up, up, up. Let's see how many people didn't use deodorant today. <laughs> Well, you put your hands down real quick, huh? <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. You don't know how blessed you are to have those two hands, to have those arms. And what have you used your hands and your arms for in your life? Did you use them to build something? Did you use them to destroy something? Have you used them to, to hug somebody, to caress their skin? Or have you used them to hit somebody, to strike somebody down? What have you used your hands for? It doesn't matter. You have them, and I don't. So what is your excuse? You can not never tell me that you can't do something because I'll give you a thousand reasons why you can yes. that easily. And if I've been able to do all this in my 55 years, you can do a whole lot more if you just let God work in you. Work God in you, inside of you. Let him in. Let him take control. Let him do the work. And you just be the instrument, like I am. I'm just an instrument. That's all I am. I'd like to ask you for one quick favor. Can I ask you for a favor? Yes. All right, man, I only heard three people over here. <laughs> Can I ask you for a quick favor? Yes. Cool. That's what I like. Let go of whatever you got in your hands. Let go of your cell phone. Don't worry, they'll call back. Let go of your purse, let go of the baby. No, don't let go of the baby. <laughs> let go of whatever you got in your hands so you can have your, your hands free for a second. Okay? Close your eyes. Come on, close your eyes. Lady, close your eyes. Okay, everybody get their eyes closed. I'd like to ask you just for a few seconds for a small favor. I'd like for you to take your, take your left hand and put it on your right shoulder. Yeah, you can look over now. Now take your right hand and put it on your left shoulder. I'd like to ask you, as a small favor, to let me borrow your hands and your arms as if they were mine for a few minutes so I can hug you. I want you to let me hug you to be able to share the, share the love, share the joy, share the hope that I've come to, that I've come to know, that I've come to learn 
and to now make it a part of your life. The day I was born, my mom took me in her arms and she hugged me real tight in the same way that I'm hugging you right now. She hugged me real tight and she said, let it be God's will. Well, I'm here to tell you that exactly what my mom asked for, she got. Because my whole life has been God's will and will continue to be God's will because it's my choice. With this hug, this is a hug that you can give yourself anytime in your life, anywhere that you are, no matter where you're at. If you're ever at a moment where you feel alone, where you're feeling lonely, if at any time you're feeling sad, if at any time you feel like there's no one to turn to and you can't find a way out, you can give yourself this hug and remember the few moments that I came to spend with you today to tell you that it's okay. God loves you. God loves me. God loves all his people. He doesn't look at your outward appearance. He doesn't care what country you're from. He doesn't care the color of your skin. He doesn't care the color of your hair or if you have hair or don't have hair. What he cares about is what's in your heart. Let him be what's in your heart. And remember this hug at any time in your life and the three simple words that I came to, to share with you today, that if I can, you can. And more importantly, that we can do all things through Christ who lives in us.